Hello, um, and welcome to Founders Stories. Uh, my name is Mary English, and I'm the Community Manager here for Tankstream Labs Perth. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to take a minute to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we gather here today, um, the Wujak Noongar people, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel um, afterwards. Uh, for If you want to rewatch, share, uh, listen in again. Um, but for those of you who don't know about Tankstream Labs, we are a co-working space uh, for tech startups with a global focus. We have three offices across Australia, two in Sydney and one here in Perth. We were founded back in 2012 uh, by entrepreneurs um, for, like, to create a space for entrepreneurs. Um, so with that, Tankstream Labs was born um, and we exist to help support the growth and innovation of the startup ecosystem across Australia. So today, Founder Stories is a series focusing on the TSL founders and alumni and their journeys to date. It is about their startup experiences, what has worked, what hasn't, and sharing their incredible stories. Uh, it's an online discussion for about 30 minutes, and we encourage you to ask any questions in the Q&A box down below. Um, so today, we're coming to you from Perth, um, and I'm sitting down with founder and principal of Strata Cumulus Legal, David Wilson. So how are you today, David? And thank you for joining us. Hi, Mira. Thanks for having me on today. It's good to see you. Um, so firstly, tell us a little bit about yourself and your elevator pitch. Well, the elevator pitch, I guess. Um, I'm an intellectual property lawyer, principally, and I work with businesses, particularly in the startup and tech space, but also others. And I help to identify and protect their intellectual property I help them to identify and respect intellectual property that belongs to other people. And I can help to, to defend claims um, that might be made um, by third parties and defend those claims when they allege that you're misusing their intellectual property. And I can do all sorts of other legally things because after all, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. So, but I like working with businesses in that space and, and, and their various legal legal needs. That, that, that's, the, that's the very quick yes. overview. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about your startup journey then. Uh, so last year you ventured um, out and started your own consulting business called Strata Cumulus Legal. Uh, why did you decide to start your own business and what was kind of the driving force behind that? Well, the driving force behind it probably started more than a year ago. Um, it started when small children came along and we, my wife and I started having family. Um, it's my 11th wedding anniversary today. So happy wedding anniversary to my lovely That's wife, who I have every confidence is not going to watch this. <laughs> but I'll, say, I'll say that anyway. Um, but uh, I had been working at a big law firm for all of my career until about three years ago. And that's when our second child came along. Well, he just turned four the other day. So he was a, he was a one-year-old basically when, when, I, when this all sort of started happening. But my wife... Went back to work after her eight months of parental leave. And I was thinking, well, we've got one child and that juggle has been really difficult for the last two to three years with one child and both of us working full time. What's it gonna look like with two kids? And um, that prompted me to say, this is not gonna work. <laughs> so I left um, and I spent six, five or six months at home as a stay at home dad, which was a great time. Um, very busy, didn't get, nearly as much done as I hoped because obviously my eight month old baby grew up and turned into a little toddler and did all the things he should have been doing, including, you know, wanting more attention and, and um, interaction with, with, with the world. Um, and it got to the point where I, I had another role for a little while um, on a project that uh, COVID came along and interrupted that because that involved people traveling all over the place. So that was, I think, a signal for me to um, press the button and start up my own practice. So the timing in one sense couldn't have been worse because it was the beginning of COVID. But on the other hand, uh, what, what did I have to lose from it? Um, so I set up a, a very small fledgling consulting business where I um, can help, as I said a minute ago in, in the elevator pitch section, I can help small businesses and, and whoever else, but particularly I like working in the IT and tech space. I have a history of being uh, working in intellectual property law and now this allows me to do the type of work I, I want to do 
and, and focus on, on doing it in a way that I enjoy while still trying to maintain some sort of flexibility around, uh, around kids. So uh, the story is that my wife works full time, I don't. Yeah. And um, that's just the juggle and how it kind of works. Yeah, that's nice. Um, now, so for those of us who don't know or really know out there, um, including myself, tell us a little bit about intellectual property law and its importance. Well, intellectual property is one of those things that I think a lot of commercial people think they know what it is, but when they come and talk to a lawyer, they work out that there's a mismatch of expectations between sort of the way the term is used in a, in a daily commercial sense and, and the way lawyers use it in a, in a technical sense. And so I, I like to help sort of bridge that gap a bit and, and work, with, um, work with people to identify what, ident what IP assets they actually have and, uh, and how they can best exploit them for their business. So there's, a, there's no single thing of intellectual property. It's, it's, it's a term used to describe a number of different rights and different people use it in different ways. But the most commonly known forms of intellectual property is copyright, so the expression of ideas and concepts, and the most consumer-friendly pieces of copy, copyright that people will identify with are movies, music, software, that sort of thing, but also business documentation and manuals and um, marketing materials and photographs and artwork and all sorts of different things. Patents, protect inventions, it's a fairly fairly high threshold to get a patent, mm. but um, it, you have to come up with something that's new, never been done before, and is a an inventive step. It's called over the existing te technology base in that field. Mm -hmm. But patent is another form of intellectual property. Um, a registered design protects the shape and appearance of a manufactured product. Again, it's got to be something new in the zoo, unique, um, not done before. Yeah. Um, so it might be the shape of the might be the shape of a uh, piece of consumer packaging. If you come up with a new bottle shape for your new soft drink, maybe yeah. maybe that would be registrable as a design. Um, everyone's familiar with trademarks and branding. Mm -hmm. So it could be a word, slog word slogan, uh, logo, whatever it is that identifies that your business and distinguishes it from, from others. Mm -hmm. And there's a few other minor forms of intellectual property as well. I guess the one that um, comes up fairly often is confidentiality as well. People want to protect their trade secrets and their business information from being seen by others where legitimately where you, where you can do that. So altogether, those things lumped up are commonly referred to as intellectual property. And the thing that makes it difficult to work with for businesses is they're all intangible. None of them are physical things. So it's easy to conceptualise, sorry, it's difficult to conceptualise what they might be and it's easy therefore to conflate some of those concepts together. So that's where I can assist to identify what it is and, and how to best use it for your business and also how not to misuse other people's intellectual property and get yourself in hot water. Yeah, right. Um, so going back a bit, we all know the process of starting any business is difficult. However, starting a business during a global pandemic is a whole nother story. Uh, what were some of the challenges you faced and what were the impacts that had on your initial success, if any? Well, I don't know if you're using the word success yet, Mira. I think we're too soon into that. Um, I'll say this up front. I think here in Perth, we've been extremely lucky that we've been almost unaffected by the pandemic in many ways. I mean, of course, there are some businesses that have been, but in terms of lockdowns and restrictions on our, on our daily life, we've been extremely lucky that we've had very little. I've got family living in Melbourne and they've just been through a hell of a time in the last 12, yeah. 18 months. And compared to that, um, we've had it very, uh, very good here in Perth. Mm. So, uh, you know, starting a business during the global pandemic, I mean, I think in my case, I've been much more affected by the time constraints of having a young family than I have by the pandemic itself. I suspect that's a factor in the background there somewhere, particularly when it, gets, when it comes to getting out and gaining traction among um, putting, my, putting my best foot forward and meeting and mingling with people. You know, a lot of events have been cancelled, things are online, um, yeah. even here, and, and that made it hard to get out and meet and greet people. But um, I think the bigger factor for me has been simply the time constraint of being a parent trying to run my kids around Perth with playgroups, school drop off school pickups. Um, today, for example, is the first day of term four in school here, 
but my, my son's school has got a, a teacher only day. And yeah. so I've got my son at home down in the next room watching watching cartoons. Don't tell my wife, but she's not watching anyway, um, while I'm in here talking to you for an hour. So I think that's really been the challenge for me has been juggling all of that um, whilst uh, trying to start up something and, 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 and get some traction going. Uh, so I think, I think your question was, what impacts has it had on, on my success? I, I think the answer is it's really, um, uh, what's the word? It's, it's moderated my expectations of what I can realistically achieve. Yeah. And I think one thing when, you, when you're starting out like this, you need to think about what success means for you. And I think in my context, it, it can't, success cannot mean earning squillions and squillions. Yeah. Well, maybe that's not important to me anyway, but, um, but it's more about keeping things going, keeping myself active, keeping my professional skills alive, keeping yeah. my business network running, also whilst being a, a dad to the kids. Yeah. So going from that being a dad and wanting a good balance between work and dad life, um, what is one of the core reasons you chose to start your own business? Like, how do you manage the two of like work and being a father or full-time father? Um, and do you manage to maintain that good balance? Well, there's no good balance. <laughs> it's just a juggle you're constantly striving for. I think someone once told me, the, the term work-life balance is, is misleading um, yeah. because it sort of implies to many people, maybe not everyone, but it implies that you divide up your time equally between work and, and not work-life. Yeah. I think a, a much better way to express it is work-life satisfaction, mm -hmm. which is making sure that, you know, whatever your personal situation is, that you're, you're satisfied with the, with, the, um, with the balance or, or the... That's the word I'm trying to avoid using, isn't it? But you're, you're satisfied with your with the ability to mix those two things and juggle those two things together. But it's an impossible balance to, to ever get completely right and you've always got to make compromises. Um, I mean, it is the one of the core reasons I chose, I, one of the core reasons I'm going down this pathway. But um, I think my expectations have um, probably become more realistic as time has passed. That um, when I started out, I thought, well, I've got school drop off at nine, I can then hit the desk and I've got school pick up at three and I've got six, six solid hours to just work away. And you know, you know that doesn't happen because yeah. for my son to have school uniform ready for tomorrow, I've got to do two loads of washing or whatever it is. And then I've got to do this and I've got to do that. So you, your time is always going to be constrained by the things that are outside outside the work environment. Um, but that's also one of the reasons why I came in to start working at Tank Spring Labs recently, yeah. was to get some, some, some clear headspace <laughs> away, from, away from all those distractions. And yeah. I can sit down with some adults around me who probably don't want me interrupting them, but, um, but it's nice to have some adult conversation in the office and, and, and sit down and, and talk. So, you know, that's one of the small things I can do to try to get that that, yeah, that sort of balance back again. No, that's good. Um, so following on from that, what kind of advice could you give to a dad or any parent um, looking, uh, who's looking down a similar path such as your own? I'm, gonna, I'm going to constrain my comments to dads, not all parents, um, because these are issues that working mums have been facing for decades and decades and decades and working dads typically haven't been. You don't even hear that expression, working dads, very much. And, and maybe we should hear it more. So I, I think what I would say is um, you've got to think about this stuff. And I confess, I didn't think about this stuff nearly enough before, I, um, before children came along, what it was going to look like. I think I was just going to, in my mind, it was all just going to work out and it was all just going to take care of itself and um, life was going to be, was going to be fine. But yeah. you have two little, I've got two little creatures, um, very lovable, uh, fine creatures, but they, uh, they need a lot of attention at times. And even when they're not physically at home, you've still got to be doing running around and things to, um, to get ready, to get things ready for them. So I, I think especially for dads who, you know, stereotypically haven't thought about these things very much. And particularly if, you, if your wife or your partner also has her own career, 
it's something you really need to think about pretty pretty early on and better than I thought about it um, is, is how how are you going to manage it who's going to take um, who's going to take I guess the time to keep everything running smoothly or to what degree are you prepared to outsource your parenthood to others it's always possible to delegate um, there's a there's a cost that comes with that monetarily but also um, the relationship you have with your kids if you if you delegate out too much but you know this is something that all families have had to deal with for such a long time but I just think that um, for so many years that it's just been seen as a working mum issue and that that it really shouldn't be anymore I'm a, I've become a firm believer that for women to maintain their careers and be encouraged to um, stay in the workplace and advance their uh, advance their careers, men need to get out of the way. Mm. Um, that's the only way it's going to it's going to work. Yeah. And spending time with your kids is fantastic. It's great fun. So mm. after this call finishes, my son and I on our day of last day of school holidays, we're going to do some cooking. And then we're going to do some uh, we're going to do some work in the garden together by planting a, um, some herbs in a pot for my son to um, have ready. Yeah. When we do some cooking next time, so I'm not going to get much work done today after this call finishes. So you're still getting work done. You're spending time with your kids. That's right. It's unpaid work though. Um, but as a working dad um, and full time full time dad working. Um, have there any been like any challenges you've noticed as being a dad, being the main person at home with the kids? Have you? I wouldn't say that challenge. I mean, challenge in the sense that um, it, it involved reinventing myself a bit, um, but nothing I was nothing I ever shied away from. Yeah, more more than happy to to do all those things. But um, I take my younger son um, to a play group kindy twice a week and I am typically the only dad um, yeah. year, and year in year out that's been the case I mean you do get some other dads occasionally but it's certainly not not a, a spot where where fathers are seen with their you know two-year-old three-year-old children very often um, I'd like that to change I, I, I don't know if that's such a challenge I mean it's it's not it's not difficult to take your kid to a playgroup <laughs> but in that sense um <laughs> I mean, there's been other challenges that, I mean, that any parent faces that, you know, just when your kids are growing up. Um, mm. um, some of them I probably, <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking about that. <laughs> some of them are pretty grisly and gruesome when it comes to, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about <laughs> people don't want to hear publicly me talk about toilet training, but um, but that, that was quite a quite a spell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, not, let's not get into that. Let's not hear about that toilet training uh, on a Monday morning. It is a challenge though. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Fair enough. Um, okay, so just going back a bit, back to intellectual property. Yes. Um, what uh, is a, your good, thought, a good segue like, from toilet training, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what is your like real interest in uh, intellectual property? Like what got you interested in it? Oh, so long ago. Um, I have always been interested in I don't have any sort of tech or engineering or science education background to me, but I've always been interested in how the law is always behind where technology is up to. Yeah. And so, for example, the, the history of copyright law has always, the protection that copyright has afforded things has always increased incrementally as new technologies have been invented or, or evolved. So copyright first existed because somebody invented the printing press and all of a sudden to copy a book, you didn't have to handwrite it. You could actually, you could actually mechanically reproduce a book much more quickly. Mm. And then it evolved. So we still call, in the Australian Copyright Act still calls a moving image. It calls it a cinematograph film, despite mm. digital technology. That's pretty archaic, but that's what it's called. Um, and, and then there's been added bits of copyright for sound recordings, um, for um, various bits of digital technology. And, and one, the next challenge I think for copyright, and I know it's only one type of intellectual property law, is going to be um, artificial intelligence and automation. So I, I think at the moment that, and I think it's, it's probably more than just my opinion, I think it's probably fairly right to say that if, 
let's say you've got a drone flying over a, a, a field or taking aerial photographs completely autonomously yeah. um, and there's no human involved in actually taking the picture, yeah. I think that there's no copyright existing in that photograph at all because the Copyright Act requires there to be an author. Yeah. Now, you could argue that the pilot of the drone is taking the photos and it's always going to be a matter of fact just to assess the degree to which that's, that's actually the case. Yeah. But in my scenario, just assume it is entirely autonomous and there's no person involved. So you've got all this imagery, yeah. but no, nobody owns it at all. So how are you going to monetize that or make a business model out of that? Right. But wouldn't so that's going to be the next type of challenge we see. Conversely, we've just seen a new patents case in Australia that said that um, an artificial intelligence system can be an inventor for the purposes of the Patents Act, which is kind of the opposite conceptually to the, to the copyright scenario I just discussed. Yeah. Uh, we'll see how that goes because yeah. that, that decision is the subject of an appeal at the moment. Yeah. But this type of challenge is going to be the next frontier, I think, in intellectual property law and then probably other areas of law as well is, is the evolution of automation and artificial intelligence. So I've always, I've always enjoyed how yeah. the law is playing catch up to where technology is at. And in this yeah. area of law, it's, um, it's no different. So to answer your question, I think that's how I originally got into IP law. Um, it, it's just something that's always interested me ever since I was a uni student. Yeah, no, it definitely is a, like, very interesting area. Um, I don't know much about it, but I've like from what we've been chatting around in the office, I've been intrigued and there's a lot of things I've never thought of before or considered. Um, and it's very important to think about. Yeah, well, 20 years ago when I was a baby lawyer, I think I was, you know, the topic that was, was the hot topic of the day was how is the law going to cope with um, people registering domain names that are too similar to somebody else's brand name? Mm. there's a whole piece on that well, that's all settled down now that's kind of that's kind of all looked after but it just shows you how as new bits of technology evolve or new new online um developments occur mm. um it, we need to think about how the law is going to adapt and cope with it yeah no definitely yeah. um so what is one piece of advice that you have for any new founders or any budding entrepreneurs looking to launch their own startup well, in my area of law, I would say when you're developing your initial business plan, which I hope you're doing anyway, not just, not just launching on a, on a bit of a wish and a prayer and hoping it all goes well, when you're, when you're preparing your business plan and, and scoping out your business model and what it looks like, make sure you devote some time and attention to thinking about the intellectual property that your business will both own and use um, particularly for tech startups where you're IP rich, working in an IP rich environment. Because the lesson is that every business both owns and uses intellectual property. Mm. And working out, um, working out in your business plan or uh, an IP review or an IP audit or whatever you want to call it, what is your business going to produce and create from an IP point of view? Making sure that your business owns it Mm -hmm. Making sure you've got the correct arrangements in place with your, your people and contractors to make sure that you actually own what you think you do. How is your business going to exploit it or, or protect it? I mean, there's two things with intellectual property. One is to make sure that you, uh, two, I guess there's two alternatives. Um, one is to monopolise the IP so that you get the advantage over using it, or the other is to um, monetize it and license it out to others and you, you have a revenue stream. Um, maybe you can mix those two things together in some business models, but you know, usually it's one or the other. Yeah. So how are you going to do that? And then the flip side is making sure that you don't um, infringe other people's intellectual property rights. Um, no doubt you will be using other people's IP in your business. Um, everyone does it. The fact that we all use um, software to run our businesses means that all those terms and conditions that you sign up to when you, when you, uh, when you install a new piece of software in your computer, that's, that's all dealing with somebody else's intellectual property. Um, how are you going to manage all, all of those things? I mean, the software is an easy example, but there might be more uh, less, or less obvious examples of where you're using um, photographs or, or images or artwork in your marketing materials. Where does that come from? 
Um, the fact that you paid someone to create it, does that necessarily mean that you, you own it or you just have a right to use it? How limited or broad is that right to use it? You need to, you need to be aware of these things. Because the last thing that a, a small and a young business needs is somebody uh, writing a letter of demand to them saying, please stop using my trademark or please stop using my brand name or you've been very, very, very nice brand name you've got there, but it's, uh, it's too clever by halves because it's too close to mine. And it's an easy pitfall um, for small and young businesses to fall into. So make sure that your business plan deals with these things. Yeah. So we've just had a question come through. Um, so as a lawyer working as a consultant slash dad now, rather than at a large firm, have yes. you found it difficult to keep with the CP, C, CPE, continuing professional education, opportunities and responsibilities? Um, how do you plan to keep up to date? Are there any other things that you have had to take responsibility for now that was previously managed by your previous employers? Uh, great, great question. I spent all my time doing admin. So I've got, but I've got all the time in the world to do admin. Um, it just means I don't have so much time to actually go and find clients. So, you know, it's another thing you've got to balance if you're going down this path. Um, for the, for the non-lawyers out there, um, you may not realise just how regulated a profession we are. And that's good for you as consumers of legal services. It's very important. But at the same time, we're, we're heavily regulated. So to even become, uh, uh, even as a solo practice, I have to go and do a course at the College of Law called the Legal Practice Management course, which is sort of the equivalent of a, of a, um, a, a single uni subject, I guess. Yeah. It's about the business of running a law firm. And you've got to do that before you're allowed to have an unrestricted practicing certificate here in most states of Australia now. So certainly here in Western Australia, I think in New South Wales and May, I don't know about Victoria, anyway, but WA and New South Wales, certainly and other states as well. Um, so you have to set up the practice, you have to get all your insurances arranged, you have to get all the regulatory stuff fixed up and, and your, continuing your continuing professional development, which is the, the point of the question, is, is just, just a part of all that. Um, I could glibly say I have all the time in the world to, um, to listen to seminars and things um, and I, I take it quite seriously and make sure I do. Um, but it also gives you some opportunities as well. Um, I ran a seminar just recently through Tankstream Labs um, for one of Tankstream Labs' other um, members here in Perth, the um, Perth Machine Learning Group. Mm. I was invited to give a seminar on, uh, I, I discussed artificial intelligence and, and intellectual property and who, who owns it, particularly in light of that patent case I was talking about recently. And that was an opportunity to apply for the Legal Practice Board here for um, approval of that event as a CPD activity. So it creates, it creates opportunities as well so that when I want to do my marketing, if, it's, if it qualifies for CPD approval, then um, that's, that's a way to gain points and fingers crossed if, uh, if approval from the, the board comes in uh, for yep. attendees to, to gain their professional um, points as well. Yeah. That was very interesting. So you've got to think about these things as an opportunity, not only as a, a burden on your, on your practice, but there are so many things that, um, that you have to take care of now that, that when you're working for a law firm that an HR team just takes care of for you. Yeah. Not just the regulatory things. I mean, I made a joke with you the other day, Mira, didn't I, that um, I, I, got my, uh, I got my marketing team to do a, a social media post and I got my IT guy to upload it and then I, um, it was all me. <laughs> there's, no <laughs> one else. there's no one else. You just wear all the different hats. It's fine. Correct. <laughs> Um, so what have you got planned for the future of Strata Cumulus? Well, I've got some plans for down the track, but just for now, like I said before, I'm a, I'm a very fledgling business and I think it's going to be in that form for quite a while, at least while my kids are, are young. Mm. And that's completely fine. Yeah. Um, but I do need to um, just keep gaining traction, let people know I'm here mm. um, and, and get up and running. And, and then perhaps when I'm a bit more confident with that, and, and things are happening a bit more than they are at the moment. Um, I've got some ideas of a few things I'd like to do. I'll keep them under my hat for now. Fair enough. But Fair I, enough. I think there is a couple of things to do. Um, I, I'd like to develop some more products mm. that, um, that generate some, um, uh, I, I guess, generate some documentation, some products that people would be able to download and, and generate some passive income while I, I can get in there and do the more bespoke um, actual consulting. Yeah. 
that, that I enjoy doing with people. Um, that's one way of perhaps expanding a little bit, but it takes a bit of time and effort to, to get those things up and running. Um, and I, I won't talk about it in this call, but Mira, I mentioned something to you the other day, which is a, an idea of what I'd like to do. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, which we'll talk about later, but um, uh, let's see if we can get that up and running as well. So there's a few ideas floating around. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, well, we just hit the 10.30 mark, um, so wrap it up. But thank you so much for joining us today, David, and sharing your story. And thank you to all the attendees who watched along. Um, we run the Founder Story Series once a month um, in 2021. Um, and if you'd want to access any of the content from previous sessions or this session today, you can find it on our website or on our YouTube channel. Um, and we also have a digital membership that you can sign up for to access all of our online exclusive member only content as well. Um, so thank you everyone and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Thanks David. Sarah. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody.